I would like to begin this convening by expressing some gratitude. Having the opportunity to co-curate the 14th Sharjah Biennial has been a dream come true. It has been an occasion to put into conversation thoughts that have confused, confounded, and haunted me for years. Certainly, all artists have several stories that haunt and obsess them, and likewise, curators have stories that become points of continual fixation. As a curator, I have seen my role fundamentally to be that of a storyteller who works through obsessions, obsessions made manifest in the work of artists. Art's potency emerges from its ability to create conversation. Indeed, in Create Dangerously, Albert Camus noted that art cannot be a monologue. It invokes, as he articulated, the high seas. In Making New Time, I worked through my own fixation with the concept of time and its warped acceleration. Chronological time, irregular time, fake time, real time, dream time. This le led us to conversations between consciousness and sleep, the space between man and machine, and the unknown artifacts of history. I would like to begin by thanking Sheikh Ahurik Qasimi, who extended this generous invitation to co-curate this edition of the biennial, and who was unwavering in supporting ideas no matter how challenging they were. Reem Shadid has been a bedrock. You are quite simply magic. I want to extend my sincerest thanks to the whole curatorial team, Ryan Inoue, Mu'min Al-Ajouz, Maryam Al-Askari, Anahita Harding, Carmen Hassan, Zain Al-Qattan, Aman Al-Khaja, Noor Al-Mu'alla, Maya Al-Qadi, Amika Raj Gupal, Mahmoud Al-Safadi, Raneem Turjman, and Ayman Zidani. I want to give a particularly special shout out to Judith Greer, Director of International Programs, Nawar Al-Qasimi, Development Manager, and Najiba Aslam. Wow. Anyone who knows anything about SAF knows what miracles Najiba has worked for all of us. <laughs> Wassan Youssef, I just want to say how amazing you are. It's because of her that we have this amazing catalog for making new time. It's a pretty book. I cried when it came. <laughs> To my co-curators, Zoe Butt and Claire Tancon, thank you for being a constant source of inspiration. Your response to the theme of leaving the echo chamber, your responses to the theme of leaving the echo chamber have enthralled and challenged me in so many ways. To my co-convener for today, Saira Ansari, thank you. This would have been impossible without you. And of course, I would like to extend my deepest gratitude to today's speakers and to the artists who, despite great adversity, have managed to keep the fire still burning in my belly. So I'll begin. I wrote this on December 23rd, 2018. It is an internal monologue that was never intended to be read out loud. Have you ever been on your phone in a crowded place and while texting, surfing, scrolling, skimming, you found yourself just surging into euphoria only to realize that you are lost in a surfeit of nothingness? You've all but disappeared into your screen, become disembodied, a body without organs, floating in the intangible world of your screen. You pause and scratch your head and start to ask yourself a series of existential questions about your lived experience and begin to wonder if you are the protagonist in Albert Camus' The Outsider. Are you bored, emotionless, detached, and cynical? Will you not let anyone pray for you even on your deathbed? Will you simply wallow in Camus' words in the tender indifference of the world? You seek solace through the ills of capitalism. You are the click-happy bait to the algorithm. You're in cruise control, on Amazon, searching for your recommended purchases. It's the 23rd of December, and you realize that Amazon won't deliver on Christmas Day. 
You start plowing intangible objects into your proverbial basket and continue to the checkout zone until you find that something, will, something that will arrive in time. An object that a drone will deliver before the 25th of December, whatever it is. It is Rachel Cusk's outline, a book that you've seen on the shelves of Foyle's bookstore on Charing Cross Road, but that you've never quite wanted to read. But now that it's the only thing you can get your hands on, you suddenly decide that it is a thing of value. That is, of course, until it arrives, and you find yourself hollowed because of its inability to satiate even your most basic desires. You skim the pages of the art history books that you acquired as a graduate student. You look to art as a form of therapy, hoping that it can produce love and empathy in you. But then you realize that reproductions lack the phenomenological qualities that you so desire. These images do not stir anything within you. As you skim the pages, you come across an idea, an idea that you decide you want to link back to something you've read earlier, only to realize that you have forgotten what it is you have ingested. Are you only half conscious? You Google a synopsis of the book that you are reading, Google now being your memory bank. You are too lazy to turn back the pages. Your brain no longer fires on all cylinders. It is transmuted. A large chunk of your brain is now amorphously tethered to the cloud, a poor metaphor for a series of cables that live beneath the sea, which contain all the constituent pieces of knowledge that you are no longer able to recall. Have you ever thought that you need to slow down? But haven't you slowed down already? You are at a glacial pace. You are functioning out of an automated body, a body that is no longer yours to control. This body is a harbinger, harbinger for a new world order where your capacities of thought to think the most basic of things will be reduced to the whims of a pre-programmed machine, question mark. You read the words of the dead, an odd temporal lapse. You are discomfited by the fact that you cannot find words amongst the living or rather even within yourself to articulate how you feel, or reason as to why you raise pen to paper, or why you choose to speak at forums such as these. Albert Camus' Create Dangerously, a manifesto in form, speaks to you somehow. It propels you forward. You ignore being criticized or attacked and instead fear of being blamed for your silence. You will not be aloof. You know of silence's dangerous implications. You must go on living and creating. You find solace in the words, which more than 50 years later feel more relevant than ever. To create today is to create dangerously. Any publication is an act, and the act exposes one to the passions of an age that forgives nothing. No matter how many ideologies are at stake, the strange liberty of creation is possible. You believe in Emerson that a man's obedience to his own genius is faith in its purest form. You believe that artists must hold up their end of the bargain, their responsibility. Is the strange liberty of creation possible? You commit yourself to social justice. Art is a necessity. This is not a world of art for art's sake. We must contact, as Camus argues, the reality of our time, to strive for something timeless and universal. Art is the space where we can imagine an alternative to our present reality. The tension between the present and the future, between what is and what can be, between suffering and its transcendence is where the seeds of art are planted and grown. In Agua Viva, the Brazilian writer Clarice Lesprechter brings us an example of this. 
Her emotional power is let rip in the first page when she proclaims a fourth dimension known as the instant now, a fleeting unit of time that continues to refresh itself with a new instant, instants passing through the air that she breathes. She wants to possess the atoms of time and to capture the present, forbidden by its very nature, the present slips away and the instant too. I am this very second forever in the now. Attempting to formulate a means to capture the potency of a moment before it slips through our hands. The specter reminds us of art's potential to unpick the burdensome pain of time, that which lies in the interstices, at the interstices, that time which feels so heavy, that time when you are waiting for life to begin. I am reminded of a journal entry from 2018, a diary that I keep in my sticky notes function, where I wrote, I want to bear witness to something great, something monumental, something that moves the soul, but my mind and body remain unperturbed, or rather perturbed in their locked silence. I am trapped in a fishbowl, an echo chamber watching the world go by, unable to touch it. It's so close, but I cannot crack the thick glass pane that separates me from an outside reality. I am trapped in the basement of my body. When in the throes of such despondency, I often turn to the writing, the voice of my mentor, Jean Fisher. Seeking solace, I run my fingers around the curves of her printed words. It's as if we are touching saying hello across time through the sands. In Towards a Metaphysics of Shit, Fisher invokes the figure of the trickster, a protagonist in the global battlefield for the repossession of a language of subjective agency. She proclaims that we are nothing but a continuous production of otherness, creating disorder. Indeed, we might say that disorder not order, is the only norm to our and of our human reality. We desire exchange and humor that is universal, for it is the trickster emphasizing the shocking aspects of the familiar that has the ability to break down the, the binary vision in which we, li which we see and live. But how do we break down binary division? We have taken so much time, and still we stand knocking on doors waiting to be seen. Turn a blind eye, open your eyes, sight unseen. I leave you with this question from Fisher. Can art function as an effective mediator of change or resistance to hegemonic power? Or is it doomed to be a decorative and irrelevant footnote to forces more powerful than its capacity to confront? God bless all of the fallen souls.